So you're in Nashville. I am now. Yeah, I moved here from L.A. Uh, about four years ago. Oh, four years ago. Mm -hmm. Wow. From L.A. I'm going to ask you about where you've lived and everything, but I wanted to start with where you're originally from, which I think is are you originally from L.A. Or are you from north of L.A.? Well, uh, about a couple, about 200 miles north of L.A., central California, Visalia um, is where I was born. But we, we moved down to L.A. when I was five. So L.A. is pretty much all I know. Like I did all my schooling there and I lived in the San Fernando Valley uh, until I moved out and then moved over into like the Miracle Mile, um, like Carthay area. I did my time in Studio City Inn in Encino because I worked in Sherman Oaks for a little while. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, we lived in Sherman Oaks and Van Nuys, and I went to school in Studio City. I'm very familiar with all of those spots, yeah. I got to tell you right now, it's really great talking to someone that has such a great microphone. <laughs> Oh, thanks. <laughs> Seriously. I, I talk to people all the time and usually there's like a lot of like, you know, it's a big room and there's no microphone yeah. and, but your, your microphone sounds incredible. Well, thank that. you. I've uh <laughs> yes, this was definitely a priority. This is the Neumann M149. <laughs> I, whatever it is. I love it. <laughs> it, it has been my go-to vocal for years. And often if I'm in a hurry, I'll just like, you know, point this thing at whatever I want to do, a mandolin, a guitar, you know, the piano, and it it really never fails me. I sound nice. like an ass. <laughs> I know I just completely changed the subject, but I do no, that. Perfect. So um, I usually ask people when they started listening to music when they're young, but I know your father, Randy Sharp, I think he won a Grammy Award in so for, as a songwriter, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and he crossed over to many genres. So that could explain you a little bit. Can you talk about what it was like having a father that was in the music business when you were young like that? Sure. Well, if you want to really start at the beginning, my folks uh, met in high school and were playing in a band together. My mom was a singer too. Music was just in the house. You know, there were band members coming in and out, you know, staying with us for a while the band rehearsals were there uh they wow. they were really they were really young when they had me also and their taste in music is all the things that i would have chosen if i was old enough so i grew up with paul simon and bonnie raid and you know ricky lee jones and joni mitchell and james taylor like that's what was in the house and there was always something on. It, it, it's just a central part of, you know, of, of home. Um, and then having, and then once I started to, uh, you know, think about maybe what I wanted to do, first of all, they never pushed me anywhere. Like, even though my dad is in the business, uh, nobody ever assumed that I would follow that. And he never gave me, I love this. He never gave me any unsolicited advice. And anytime I had a question, he probably had the answer and he would show me around and he like, he taught me how the studio works. He helped me to set up my first studio. I mean, really, he helped me to set up everyone I've ever had. I still call him with a question every now and then, like, why is this not working? And he usually <laughs> figures it out. Um, so he was always there for the answers. And without any pressure, uh, I first I started, I first thought that I wanted to be a saxophone player. So wow. I went to college for that. And I, I was a saxophone performance major. And this was before they realized that they could actually tailor a major for real life. <laughs> so I was like, learning like classical pieces and stuff like that, instead of like, you know, having to shed a chart or having to you know like I, I was doing I was doing classes where I had to sight read and I had to arrange and all of that stuff but for for the actual uh you know like to get the degree you had to learn all these like uh like uh, French classical alto sax pieces and stuff what like school that. what school was this you were going to 
CSUN, Cal State University Northridge. Oh, so they had a music program there. Oh, and it, and it, it, you know, it was a fabulous one. Like it, it was one of the top ones in the country. Um, it just was, it, it, it hadn't switched over to like, you know, more jazz heavy, more like pop kind of real world, which I, I think it is more like that now, but still, I learned a ton and that was what I, I thought I was going to do. You know, I was playing saxophone around LA. I traveled with it a bunch. I was playing in horn sections, which still might be like the most fun you can have with your clothes on is playing in a horn section. <laughs> it's so fun. <laughs> I like, I like to so word so that. <laughs> now, you, let me go back for a second here. When your mom and dad were playing together in a band, what kind of music were they playing? uh kind of like all of those artists that i named the singer you know? songwriter types yes yeah like singer songwriter like indie rock like cali country um yeah so i didn't i mean when i started to set my sights on writing about halfway through college i realized i like the saxophone thing but it, it's not it's not going to be everything i started writing songs and i fell hard for that and I started writing, I, I realized that my instincts lie in all of those places also. So once I started writing, I did not fall far from the tree. You know, I, I'm listening to Paul Simon and Bonnie and, you know, Were, were you writing, were you writing on a guitar or did you play the piano too, or both or? I started writing on piano and uh, yeah, it's funny. The guitar took me a minute, like after after starting on the piano because we had a piano in the house that's um, awesome the mind shift to the guitar was uh, for some reason it took me a while it was very frustrating for a while probably a year of that like i would play a little bit of it in the show but i had the most anxiety about that song that i that i was going to have to play the guitar on but then it just clicked. It was so funny. And I tell, I tell people that say that they're having a hard time with a guitar. I tell them just like, just hang in there because <laughs> it's not necessarily a slow incline. It could be like frustrating, frustrating, frustrating. Oh, this makes sense. <laughs> you know, Plus now the I fingers, the fingers thing, you know, that's where I had problem when I was young, my fingers would just not get calloused up fast enough, you know? Right. Yeah. right. Um, did yeah. you, did you like start recording? I think I read maybe that you started recording at a really young age. Well, there's that anomaly there. When I was five, we had just moved down to La Crescenta and I told my dad that I had a song and he always had a tape recorder around. So it was one of those tape recorders where, you know, you have to hit the record and play at the same time. Yeah. One of those. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> yeah. So he, uh, he probably had it already out, you know, and he recorded my song. Uh, it was like a 45 second song. And that, I mean, that I guess counts as recording at an early age. But when I really started to like write songs and want to record them, I was probably 21 or 22. But he always had a studio. There was always either in our home or nearby and he was always willing to help me and and to let me get in there and you know you know see if i could record the tune or help me record the tune or sing on it with me or write it with me he was always there for that so yeah i guess you could say i was recording early then too but it was more like 21 or 22. if my research is correct it was around 97 when your first record came out so when did you start playing out first were you playing before you were writing or did you record demos how did that all lead up to when I guess you met Miles Copeland. That's what I'm going to lead it up to there. Or you can lead me to that. Sure. Uh, well, the writing came first and the falling for the writing definitely was first. Like, okay, this, this is what I love. The playing the songs out live and realizing that I was going to have to be the artist. That was a slow second. Like that was, you know, I had, I had, uh, seen through him and i had had a little bit of luck 
having my songs place with other artists, but I realized pretty early that there was, uh, a, it's a super long shot that I'm going to get every song that I write placed somewhere else. So if I want these songs heard, and if I want to write songs as often as I do, I'm probably going to have to be the one who sings them. So, so did you have songs placed before you on stage? <laughs> oh, I didn't mean to interrupt you there, but did you have songs recorded before by other people before you actually recorded your record? Well, I was writing with other people in town and I was seeing like, you know, they weren't famous, but I was seeing how I could, I could get songs on their projects. I was hearing my songs sung live, you know, at the little clubs mm -hmm. from the co-writer and, and, uh, you know, they maybe had a record deal or a publishing deal or something like that. So I saw that 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 was a viable thing. And at the time, I mean, you know, let's be real in the in the 90s at the time, it was actually a viable thing because people actually purchased albums. So you could have a song on a record and you could yeah. actually make a little bit of money. Right. Even if it wasn't a single. So um, I just knew like, OK, around 90. 92 93 i realized okay i'm gonna have to like i'm i'm gonna have to be the artist like i still love writing with and for other people but if i'm gonna make this thing really fly if this is really gonna be if i'm gonna be able to pay any bills here in any kind of a sustainable way i'm probably gonna have to be able to play live plus it kind of scared this is, is it okay to swear <laughs> yes please please do no well not really but if you want okay well no okay it kind of scared the hell out of me you know i'll i'll uh yeah i'll yeah okay whatever i won't well, go all with the swears um uh, what's interesting about what you're talking about is i was out there at that time and and i started working at AM records around 91 and after working at indies for a while and i remember that publishing companies i would go to ascap's best kept secrets and things at the coconut tea, not the yeah the coconut teaser uh -huh. and places like that and yeah. i noticed because i got i started as an a and r consultant that there were a lot of publishing people around and they were looking for people like you yeah yeah and once i got you know once i started to push through just introvert shy and not really wanting to be the center of things once i got up there on the stage I think my first live gig was Molly Malone's in 1993. I remember that place. With yeah. the full band. I think it's still there even, right? On Fairfax? Yeah, I had, maybe. <laughs> I had a full band. Um, I went all out. It was a Monday night. I remember it was a 10 p.m. slot on a Monday night, and they said, you got to bring 50 people or we're not going to have you back. <laughs> like, I don't <laughs> know. The, on a Monday at 10? Come on, man. But I did it. Like, I just like promised everybody everything if they would show up. And plus, I think that the curiosity of like uh, our friend who's a sax player who's been writing songs is going to go lead a band now. Yeah, we got to <laughs> see this, you know. So um, once I was on that road, I started playing, playing out. Uh, and uh, I had a really cool lawyer who was bringing folks out who was, you know, trying to connect me with labels and publishers. And eventually, how did this happen? Oh, so he was introducing me around and he, he might have even connected me to Miles Copeland at some point. But how I really connected with Miles and started our roads, and I say roads because it was publishing and label, was I wrote a song with my friend Mark Addison, who was the leader of a band that my friend from college was playing in so i'm playing in all these like jazz ensembles and stuff with my friends in school and they're playing all over town in other bands and i would go see their other bands and mark was leading one of these other bands and i loved his writing and i asked him if he wanted to write a song together and we did write a song together i didn't have anything going on yet no publishing no label but mark had just signed a publishing deal with rondor and mark's publisher pitched our song to Miles Copeland. Wow. For one of his artists. I think it was for Belinda Carlisle. And 
he didn't think it was quite right for his artist, but he liked the voice on the demo. He liked the vibe of the demo and I was the singer. So then Mark's publisher played it for Cher's producer and he loved it. And Cher put it on her album, It's a Man's World. So now I had a cut and I had Miles interested. And it was all was like the same year. It was 1996. And, wow. and then Miles and I started to work together. He started to send me to these songwriting retreats. That's really what he did as a publisher. He connected me with other writers, which is awesome. That's fantastic. And, I have to ask you who that lawyer was, by the way. Wofford Denius. Don't know. I, I knew some entertainment lawyers out there, but that one doesn't ring a bell unless I forgot. It's a long time ago. <laughs> it's, he's just a good, he's a good human and a lawyer. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> so you um, made the uh, Hardly Grammar record in 97? Yeah, uh, it came out in 97. Yeah. What, what do you recall from Hardly that? Glamour. Yeah. What did I say? Gram what did I say? Yeah, grammar. That's okay. <laughs> sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, so, so what do you recall from that period having a record out? Um, you know, my first one, and I'm still, uh, you know, at that point and now still a little bit, like I'm still just fundamentally pretty introverted. So the idea of all of this new stuff is going to be coming at me and, you know, interviews and on airs and, more shows and uh, there was a lot of anxiety around it, but also I was really proud of the work. So, and it started this kind of rule, like if the thing scares you, I, you have to do it, you know? Like I can't, I can't just opt out because it's a scary thing. That's kind of my cue to see if I can. And so I, uh, yeah, I pushed through. A, really a lot of anxiety in those early days. I never really talk about that part of it, but um, yeah, but the love of writing and playing, playing, or I guess it wasn't so much the playing live that I loved yet. I, I love that now. I, I have loved it for the past, I don't know, maybe 10 years or so, but in those early days, it was more, I loved, I loved to make music with, with my friends. I love to write. Uh, I love to see the country. And then I would get up on a stage and just try to sell it, you know, like try to look relaxed, even though really like, oh my God. This is so, I'm so uneasy right now. <laughs> did, your, did your parents, uh, well, I guess your father, did he help out with that when you were going through that anxiety? Uh, I mean, really, I didn't, you know, I was 26 or something. I didn't really talk about it a lot because I just thought, you know, it's going to just be flight hours. And it was, it was just logging those hours. Like the more I got on a stage, the easier it was, the more I got through the scary thing, the more I would, I would be the more I could reassure myself, look, you made it through that scary thing. You're probably going to make it through this scary thing, you know? So eventually, eventually it evened out. And I was just like, okay, I got this. I've done it literally a thousand times now. A thousand and one probably isn't the time that I crashed. It's going to be all right. <laughs> you know, um, I want to get to your new record, but I don't want to blow right through all these records because it, there was a little period, I guess, between 97 and 2002 where you didn't record another record. Is there any reason why, or were you just like? Um, I, I did actually record a record for my first label and they were having a dispute with their distributor, I think. Something no. was keeping them from releasing. So we they went all the way with the recording of it. I, you know, I had the budget. I made the record, mix and mastered and then shelved waiting for them to uh work it out and then by the time they worked it out um it just didn't make sense anymore and like half of that stuff didn't feel like it was what i wanted to do anymore and then my next label concord um ended up purchasing like three or four of those songs that were intended for that unreleased album on my first label they ended up putting those on the new album so 
you know, I still got to write it. I still got to record it, but it just, that final step didn't happen because of one of the many possible hurdles that can happen when you have a record deal. Yeah. Well, I, I'm familiar with that because a couple of people I'm thinking of off the top of my head, Cheryl Crow and Patty Griffin at a and both made records that never came out. So it's like, you're, you're not the only one on, um, on the, um, 2002 self-titled record uh there was a song one good reason that that seemed to stick out people talked about that was a cool one i noticed during that period that you played on an art garfunkel record as well and there was a name that got my attention on that record billy Mann, because i worked with yeah. billy at a oh, do cool. you know billy yes of course of course i do he he produced that album it was oh, a full did? On out. yeah it was a full-on like in fact, that whole thing was his idea, man. Buddy Monlock, Art, and me, he knew the three of us separately, and he had this idea that we all should write together and record an album together and then hit the road. And so we did. There was like probably two years of my life that was with that project, focused on that project. Yeah. I haven't seen Billy in a long time, but I did go on the road for a little while when he was with Patty Griffin and Jan Arden, and he was a great guy. I think he was from Philadelphia. Yeah, yeah, really yeah. good guy. I such saw his name. Guy. I'm sorry. He's just such a talented guy too. Yeah. He's a writer on uh, a few of those songs also, and he just he produced it. He had a vision for it, and he saw it all the way through. It was really cool. Over the years, you've collaborated with a lot of people on the fine, outstanding Citizen record. There's a list of people a mile long in that record. Does it mm -hmm. just make you feel comfortable to bring all these different people into the party, or do you like to work that way? Yeah. And it is, I mean, it isn't like I need it for the comfort. I just really, I get inspired by it. I love to work with other people. Um, I, I mean, I have a bunch of co-writes on this latest record and, and on my last record too. I think it's just going to be, it's just kind of always going to be my thing. You know, I'll write, I'll write one or two songs alone on each album but the collaboration to me keeps me moving forward. It keeps it fresh. I'm learning constantly. Um, and I get to work. I mean, also a lot of my opportunities have happened through the relationships. So the more people that I can count in my circle of people that I write with and people that I record with or that I perform with, the more cool things happen. You know, I'll get a call from one of my co-writers that hey you want to do a co-bill in the northeast sure it's like that's because we know that we can hang out together in the same room because we were in the studio together you know so i think i'm always going to do that i never have felt like it's funny maybe because i'm an only child and i i spend a lot of time alone like i i spend a lot of time alone my alone time is very valuable <laughs> But when I'm working, I love that energy of having somebody else in the room. Well, that sounds really familiar. I'm not an only child, but I'm alone a lot too. But I like to work with a lot of people when I work. That's interesting. Uh, you played, you, you mentioned Bonnie Raitt earlier, and you played a bunch of shows with her around 2009, I guess, when you put Echo out. What was it like working with Bonnie? Because I think you wrote some songs with her too. Well, I wrote three songs that she put on her album Souls Alike in 2005 and started opening for her in 2005 um, around the release of that album. And then I've opened for her off and on through the years as late as about two months ago, I got to open for wow. her. Um, I, can, I mean, there are no words to describe <laughs> how amazing it, every point of contact has been with her just ha having her record my songs is such a validation i've been a f fan of hers my whole life and then to to have you know the person that you felt a connection to you have them basically tell you they feel a connection as well by choosing my songs for her album i mean that was just amazing and then opening for her and then we haven't written a song together yet but we we've hung out a lot she's a friend she's a true friend and inspiration still um and it's just it's only been a positive thing and it's so it's such a relief that i get to announce every time 
anybody asked me about her that she is as cool as you think she is like she she is that just totally down to earth and real and funny and generous and it's all it's all true she's legendary great guitar player too oh, a lot God. of people yeah. love her style and look up oh. to her and she's rocking it i mean she just she's still just like has the mojo man she just she gets out there and sounds like the record so so good and uh you know i know you changed the ending uh dash between the dates mercy uh rising uh there's some really good songs so i was listening to the records me after you from change the ending i liked nothing but the radio on from the dash between the dates i did a little deep dive into you this week yeah thank you well, I wanted to get up to Reckless Thoughts because I listened to that record several times. Uh, I was going to start off like this. So what kind of people are your people? Of course, I'm <laughs> making a reference to the song that I really like on that record. I, actually, I want to talk about that one because can you talk? The song's called Kind. I really mm -hmm. like it. And it's like, you. F where, where were you getting at there? I mean, I know it seems obvious, but there could be something between the lines. Well, um, uh, yeah, it's funny. We actually kind of started that from more of a venting, possibly negative viewpoint. Uh, let me see. We got we wrote that one in 2019. Um, Dean Fields and Mindy Smith and I, and we, you know, we started we started the writing session pretty much how a lot of them. You know usually start like how are you how you feeling what's going on mindy i've known for years probably 25 years and dean i think i had just met but dean and mindy had known each other for a while so we were just kind of hanging out and we're we were all you know this is during the previous administration and we were all pretty frustrated with what appeared to be this unapologetic lack of kindness like there were just so many stories where people were just awful to each other and it was like a, a badge of honor or something. It was like, what is even happening? Like, what is the shift in acceptability with how people treat other people, particularly strangers? Like what the hell's going on? And so it started like that. And we realized, you know, people probably don't want to hear a vent session in their song. How about something positive? So we started talking about, you know what, all we really care about is that you are kind. And there's, I wow. think a couple of us even had stories of like having a major difference of opinion, you know, political or religious upbringing, or, you know, there can be really, you know, different things about somebody sexual orientation there's a million things you know the color of your skin right whatever the none of that matters at all <laughs> really like you know all three of us have very close friends that are all of the things and the the thing that is you know the common thread the only thing that we really care about that's like the number one we can be friends if you know how to treat other people Kindness. Wow, that's really good. Did that all happen when you moved to Nashville? Were you? I mean, you, I know what you're referring to. 2016 to 2020 was a very strange period, and yeah. so and you had moved down there during that period, right? Yeah. So you're going from a very more liberal, you know, open state to like Tennessee. Yeah, but I'm also coming to a part of the state that feels closer to California Nashville. than I was, I was even expecting. Yeah. There's a lot of Californians here and a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, artists and writers and it's, it's kind of another set of rules there or a shorter list of rules, I guess you could say. <laughs> yeah. A little bit of a sidebar. So when you go out and you're around Nashville, cause I've been down there several times and I, I know there's, is it still the same as musicians literally everywhere you go? Uh, it's still the same in that respect. Yes, there, is, there, there are musicians, there are killer musicians. There's like top call, amazing, can play anything players everywhere. Yeah. But in the other ways, it's changing 
constantly. I mean, the landscape of it is changing, you know, the, the development of it is constantly changing. People that even haven't been here for five years will roll up on it and like, what is happening? That, oh, that, that whole street is different. And, you know, there's, it's, it's expanding um, to the east and the north, which is, I don't know what that is. That like when a city expands, it tends to go east and north. I'm not sure why. Is it a mindset here too? Is there a mindset expand expansion too, or just a ge- you know just a growth in the area? Well, I I think there is. I mean, I have you know I'm only one viewpoint, and I'm a very California viewpoint, and I'm also like the California the fairly recent California transplant musician so that's going to be one lens you know (laughs) if you if you ask somebody who's lived here for 40 years who's like just outside of town they might have a different answer but yeah i think it's 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 expanding and it's it's uh at least for me it's it had become a hospitable place where maybe 20 years ago, it wasn't so much. It was like the place where I really love to visit and I love to come here and write. And, you know, I had my circles and then I would fly back home to Los Angeles and that felt right. And then these last few years is like, no, actually this could be a landing place, you know? Nashville, I always found interesting. I remember one story because, you know, about the musicians everywhere. I was working with this metal band called Intruder and I went down and we're in the street and we're just walking on the street. And one of them goes, there's Will. And I thought it was one of their friends. And we get up close and it's Will Sexton. I'm like, holy oh, shit. Yeah. We ran into Will Sexton walking down the street. Is Charlie around? You know? Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's what I felt feel about Nashville. It's that kind of a place absolutely look over and you know vince gill is having an omelet with you you know a table over have you run into taylor yet (laughs) i have not no oh actually wait a minute no i did meet her years ago i met her i was writing with liz rose at her publishers and liz and taylor wrote a lot of those songs from the first two albums and uh yeah i was writing with liz taylor wasn't a huge thing yet but she was there i think they were gonna write right after us and she was really young i don't even know how i mean i think she was still in her teens and she had like a stack of notebooks and she was just out out in the hall and she was super nice and liz introduced us oh here's this new artist that i'm working with oh hey it's nice to meet you wow that's cool Five years later, it's Taylor Swift. <laughs> yeah, she Great. just sold out uh, a seventy thousand uh, are- uh, outdoor festival here three days in a row, not just once, but two hundred and ten thousand tickets. That's well, outside that. of Boston. That's amazing. Yeah, she did that here in Nashville too, uh, at the largest arena. I don't know what the capacity is, but she did three nights there. And I don't know if you saw this this part, but uh, you know. Our weather here is totally wacky. And so there was like a lightning, thunder, rain, storm, and they had to delay a couple of the nights. And she hung in there and just started late and like went until 2 a.m. and everybody stayed. And that was a part of the triumph, you know. She performed in the pouring rain at Gillette Stadium here in Massachusetts, like for three hours nonstop. The video footage is remarkable. I wasn't there, but I I really admire her. I never thought that I was going to go down that road, but, you know, she's grown on me. She's cool. Yeah. And she works really hard and she is a talented person. Like she's, she shows up with a lot of ideas. She's not, if anybody ever thinks she's like artist who sits in the room and lets other people do it, that's not accurate. She has a lot of ideas. You said something that was interesting. You went to the, the, the publishing company and, they, and there were people writing there. What did they have little studios there where people just go and write together? Yeah. A lot of the publishers around here will just have a, you know, a couple of writing rooms. And so whoever they are publishing can go in and, you know, use the room and Liz was published there. And so I would just meet her there. And it was also a lot of the writing room or a lot of the publishers around here are old converted homes. So it's usually a cozy place. You know, it doesn't feel like a conference room or an office. It feels like a bedroom. 
Wow, that's interesting. Do you like writing in that kind of environment? Yeah. Yeah, and there's something about it too. It's like it's the it's a nice hybrid of you still feeling like you're doing your own thing. You're still this kind of self-employed artistic person, <laughs> but you're also in some kind of a construct. You know, there's an accepted like I don't know, a validated system here you're actually going to you're going to an office going to work in an office but then, right but then you you get to be you <laughs> so it's kind of the perfect combination i'm not i don't know i don't know the answer to this question that's why i'm asking did you do a publishing deal or have you held on to your own publishing i've had three publishing deals over the years so so miles had mine for uh those first two albums the one that was never released, but he still had publishing on those songs. And then my whole first album, and he has par partial publishing on all the songs I wrote at the retreats where he sent me. And then uh, I was published out of Nashville uh, for a few years here, uh, Major Bob. And that's actually where uh, the song plugger there, Scott Sherrod, who's awesome he got me the chicks cut and the trisha yearwood cut and then um razor and tie i signed with them and this was all all three of these deals so one was based in la one was based in nashville the razor and tie was based in new york and I, I was living in la for all of those and so i would fly around a lot like you know i would come to new york go to austin i go to nashville a bunch um so yeah i i still managed to make LA home through all of that. That's so many questions I want to ask you just from what you just said, but I'm going to get to some of them in a minute. Getting back to Reckless Thoughts, a really good record. Old Dreams is another interesting song I want to ask you about. What's going on with that one? Oh, yeah. Garrison Starr and I wrote that, and um, that just came out of a conversation. You know, whenever, so she still lives in LA, and I'm here now. When I go to LA, I stay with her. When she comes to Nashville, she stays with me. So, you know, this has happened a few times where like, we're just kind of out riding with other people during the day. And then we convene at night, have a little sip of something, you know, we're chilling out, a conversation starts, and there's these little nuggets in the conversation. And eventually, it's always her. She goes, okay, dude, you know, we have to go write this now. And it's, and I'm always the one that's like, oh God, I thought we were done. I'm not, we got to work. Ugh. And then I know she's right. So we do, and we write the song, you know, we started at like eight o'clock at night or whatever. And it's, it, I think this is my favorite one. Cause it's just so true. Like we both just needed to say this, like, you know, and in fact, this totally pertains to the conversation we're having about like the first record deal and being you know 25 at that age i formed a dream you know i thought this is what success looks like i thought it looks like a grammy and i thought it looks like you know arenas and it looks like that's what success was because i didn't know any better i didn't i didn't know anything yet i hadn't personally experienced anything yet i was just at the beginning and I just accepted, you know, kind of the template of what it's supposed to look like because I didn't have any any other reference. And then as the years go on and I build up, you know, life experience and things happen to me and I get close to stuff and I see how that really feels and if I really want it and all that, I, I need to check myself now 25 years later and really see if with all of that new information is that 25 year old's dream still mm. mine is that really still what i want because i have a lot i have so much more to work with now and i know more about myself i know more about uh those things that I was told were success. I know so much more now. I need to let that seep in, sink in, and inform the dream moving forward. 
And so once we got to that, it was, I got to tell you, it was such a relief. It's like, oh, hell yeah. I don't need, I don't want those things anymore. I didn't really want, I didn't really know enough to want them then. I just thought I was supposed to want them. I don't want to walk a red carpet. That sounds horrible. <laughs> I love, I love what you're saying. Let go of the old dreams and come up with new dreams pretty much. Right. Yeah. And it's not even a response to like what didn't happen or what, or what, you know, it isn't like a, well, I, you know, I couldn't achieve that. It's just like, now I know me better. And I know what that thing that I thought I wanted really looks like. And what do I like, let's just take a breath. What does 50 year old me really want? You know, I want meaning. I want my songs to mean something. I want, if they mean, if they change the life of eight people, that means more to me than if a thousand people went out and bought it. You know, that's what I want now. And the 25 year old wouldn't have known that. And so I'm, I'm letting that, I'm just, you know, I'm just allowing the shift based on the, the new, you know, wisdom. And you're a good you're a good therapist my nice. therapist always says to me what do you want steve what do you want it's true i mean you get older and your your things change and you've got to readapt and i love your songwriting now do you write the music and the lyrics together or do one of you write the lyrics and one the music when you collaborate I mean, the collaborations, every one is probably a different percentage of that, but I'm, I'm in on, on all of that, you know, and my co-writers usually are too, you know, we're so like, do, do like you a have volley, the lyric volley of the music, you know? So do you have a, a song on written musically and then you add the lyrics to it? Or does it all come together? It's different every time. Some like that song, because it started with a conversation, it started with, the lyric of the chorus you know i'm tired of these old dreams i'm not even dreaming anymore that was the old me she didn't know what she was looking for okay dude we got to go write this you know so like so it started with that <laughs> i gotta say music to it yeah i gotta say it's really great talking to a real songwriter you know because you talk to a lot of musicians but I can tell that you're a songwriter beyond everything else. That's what I feel anyways. Um, you've collaborated with a lot of other musicians over the years that we've talked about. I've got a few written down here, Lisa Loeb, Carol King. Come yeah. on. Uh, you've had your songs recorded by Cher, Kim Ritchie, the chicks who you mentioned. Can you, I mean, it would be hard to go through all of these, but what is some, you, I, I know Bonnie Raitt obviously is a real highlight. Some of these other people, like the chicks, I know they recorded, I got to know Patty Griffin really well when we worked together and she ended up having like three or four songs recorded by them as well. Um, are there highlights here or they all mean the same to you? I mean, it is a thrill every single time. It is so cool. And I've been really lucky that the people that have recorded my songs are people that I already liked, you know, I was already a fan and they did a really good job with the songs. Um, the chicks is probably a highlight. It was, uh, actually one of the reasons it's a highlight is that my father and I wrote that song together, Randy Sharp and I nice. wrote that. And it, you know, and my publisher, uh, here, got that he played it for their producer on their album before the album that it actually made it onto and he said you know i'm not i'm not producing this one and he sent it to their producer for that album who was natalie mains's father lloyd mains sent it to lloyd mains lloyd liked it played it played it for the chicks and they liked it and sang the living hell out of it and that was you know kind of uh, a family victory because it was my dad and me. It was really cool that this this song that I I think only Scott heard that that this song should be pitched. I remember writing a bunch of other things, thinking, "Oh, this is so the chicks. This is right down the middle." And he didn't pitch those songs. He pitched home, and he was right. And it uh, it it landed on a record that was from what I recall was came out in an era that was toward the end of people really 
just feverishly purchasing music that they love. Did so Rick, also, Rubin, Rick Rubin do that one? Oh, wow. I think that was Lloyd Maines. Oh, okay. All right. Because I know they worked with Rick Rubin after they had all their controversy and everything, which yeah. I love them, by the way. And I love the way they stood up for themselves. Yeah. In fact, they made that record. The reason it's so like acoustic sounding is that they made the record that they wanted to make while they were fighting with the label or while they were like, we don't even want to deal with that anymore. And the label heard their finished product that they went out and did on their own and had to have it. And they ended up being able to renegotiate the way that they wanted to and make the record that they wanted to make. And it was, it was a success. It was, it just worked. It was a creative and a financial success. I'm glad you mentioned them. <laughs> um, so I want to ask, before I ask you about your future plans uh, and we wrap this thing up, are you listening to a lot of music yourself, other artists yeah. these days? Like, what do you do? Do you listen to records? Do you stream? A little bit of everything, you know, when I'm, when I'm traveling, uh, when I'm traveling, I stream, uh, I have a, um, a vinyl station here. It's kind of the center of my living room. So I put on some vinyl um, if I'm home uh and it's it's all over the place like often there are times of the day where i don't want to hear any lyrics i need to i need to kind of meditate in a non-lyrical place and so i listen to a lot of jazz <laughs> um or like somebody that i can't really understand what they're saying bon Iver is one of my very favorite artists ever and I think a part of why I love him so much is that most of the time, I'm not really sure what he's saying. That's but hilarious. I, but I feel it. It's just so emotional. So I listen to him. I'll put vinyl. He might be the only artist. No. Okay. So uh, Bon Iver and Lord Huron, I think, are my two artists where I, I have all of their vinyl. So I'll play that here. And then also I'll hit it when I'm on the plane. I want to listen to that, you know? Um, wow. But then, yeah, other, I mean, God, I have a playlist of so many, so many artists. Um, but yeah, it's really, it's all over the place. Do you lean more towards the singer songwriter thing? Or, I mean, you mentioned jazz. Do you, do you yeah. get into anything heavier than that? Uh, I don't, I'm going to say probably not. I mean, I'll lean toward, I don't even know what you would call the different genres necessarily, but like, uh, let me see. Michelle and Deggiocello, I love her. Listen to her. Um, um, D'Angelo, I love, I love his stuff. I don't know what genre that would be. I got to ask you this question. Oh, go ahead. I, I got to ask you a question. Speaking of genres, I was really surprised that someone referred to you as country queer. I mean, I've heard that expression before, and I know that there's a website and a podcast and everything, but you're not yeah. really country to me. I know. I know. <laughs> I know. I get, you know, I laugh a little bit at that because like I'm, I have no problem with the queer part, <laughs> <laughs> but the country part is like, eh, I don't know. <laughs> you know? I, I don't know. It's just, uh, you know, I guess in some respects, labels like that kind of just help to maybe find a new audience or it's easier. You know, if you can if you can boil something down to two words, it's easier to advertise it. It's I don't know. I mean, Maya, Maya Sharp moved to Nashville. She's country queer now. No, but I, <laughs> no. And also that's a. <laughs> First of all, I'm not offended by that. It's just not necessarily accurate. Like if you're a country fan, if you're a hardcore country fan, you might be a little disappointed when you hear my album because it's really not that, you know? Exactly. But, you know, as somebody who like lives on and for all of the nuances and the fact that nobody is a soundbite, you know, no sound bite, no like two words is really gonna nail it 
for anybody. <laughs> so if you want to, if, if there's a country fan that likes my stuff and they got to it because of country queer, that's fine. But it's not really country. I wasn't going to bring that up, but genres came up. So are you going on tour? Uh, yeah, I just came back from a week of shows. Uh, I'm doing some solo acoustic shows, or I just went, I did a swath up to, through the Northeast, um, up to Portland, Maine, and then back down. Uh, I'm heading out again in September. I'm kind of doing in, in these little humane, you know, bursts. It's no more like 12 weeks in a van. It's like a week of shows, a week home, a week of shows, a week home. So I have another week in Wisconsin um, coming up, and then um, a week in October uh, in Colorado. All of that stuff is on the website. You can find all the dates there uh, at MaiaSharp.com, uh, M-A-I-A. -A. Great talking to you. I knew, I knew you would be fun. Too. Well, thank you. You too. And I heard, I heard that this, that your thing is a very cool one and I should definitely do it. And she was right. Well, thank her. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, good luck to you. And I love the reckless thoughts record and I wish y'all the luck with it. Oh, uh, well, thank you very much and hope to see you again. All right. All right.